Our presenter this time is John Jossi, and he's a contributor with the Space Development Network. And he's going to talk to us about mitigating operational and human health risks caused by lunar dust. Thanks, Ben. Um, uh, good to be here. Um, my name is John Josie. Uh, like Ben said, I'm a contributor to the Space Development Network. Um, I, uh, I have a bachelor's in physical science from UC Berkeley. I got way back in 1980 with a, a minor in astronomy. Um, so I've been um, in industry ever, ever since then. <laughs> and I recently retired so I can spend more time on space advocacy. So um, with that, uh, I'd just like to say that, um, you know, I'm a contributor to the Space Development Network. Um, I encourage folks to um, go to this website. This, all the material in my presentation came from here. There is a wealth of information here, and I'm sure um, uh, many of you have been here. Doug Plata set this up, and um, I think he was one of the keynotes yesterday. So um, that's where I got the information. Um, just a little bit more. I, I also blog at spacesettlementprogress.com. We won't go there, but if you get a chance, check it out. And I try and keep up with all the latest technology on, on space settlement. So um, with that, uh, we'll get into the agenda. And I just want to confirm that my slides are progressing, Ben. They look good. OK, cool. Real easy agenda. Just um, you know, we'll talk about what the problem is, some solutions, and then I'll have some closing thoughts. So. Um, as everyone knows, you know, we, we have this dust problem on the moon ever since we've got there. It's, it's been a problem, you know, with, with billions of years of, of um, micrometeorite bombardment, um, the regolith has got pulverized into this glassy material. Um, it's very dangerous stuff. Um, you know, lunar landers come down with a very high velocity of their plumes and they can blow the dust all around the surrounding areas, um, causing damage to anything that's, that's near the site that you come down to land and, have, and has been um, noted uh, earlier by um, other people. You can launch this stuff into orbit. It's, it's, uh, it's a real hazard. Um, a particular concern is um, if we're coming down near heritage sites, um, like the Apollo landing sites, um, that's, that's going to be a real problem if we're starting to uh, destroy that. I encourage folks to um, uh, attend the um, presentation by Michelle Hanlon for, for All Moon Kind, and um, that's coming up, I think, um, this afternoon. Um, so um, it's, the, the dust is, is a problem. It gets, it gets into everything, especially as a consequence of, of EVAs or driving rovers around. Um, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I went right to the end. Um, so uh, the, uh, the dust can be electrostatically charged and sticks to everything. Uh, including spacesuits. So it can really get into um, moving parts of uh, equipment, um, spacesuits, uh, causing all kinds of problems with uh, wear and, 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 and seizing up of the equipment. Um, you know, and then also, you know, if you bring it into a habitat, it's going to be uh, inhaled by the crew, as, as was mentioned earlier in a presentation. Um, you know, you can get that into your lungs and cause all kinds of health problems. Um, NASA has recognized this early on and um, they've um, put together some guidelines um, for protection of uh, heritage sites. I uh, encourage folks to take a look at this. Um, it is um, pretty detailed uh, about um, how to um, mitigate the problem, um, recommendations for, you know, descent and landing of spacecraft, mobility on the surface with rovers, and, and contamination and physical contact. So there's all kinds of, of, of science behind it that, that NASA's been looking at. So this is a good resource. Um, so uh, 
okay, so what do we do about this problem? So the, the first thing um, that I'd like to discuss is the use of landing pads. Um, you know, the first lander probably won't have an issue because there aren't gonna be structures in the area. But uh, as I said earlier, you know, I mean, we could launch this stuff into orbit, so we need to be careful. Um, so telerobots, I think, are gonna be really useful in, uh, in preparing landing sites and, and actually putting down um, landing pads. One, one early way to do this is with a blast resistant tarp. Um, and you secure this underneath the lander. Um, telerobots could also make berms to help redirect and reduce the blast. And I've got a little cartoon here and I hope this is gonna work. So let's uh, give it a try. So this is a, um, a, a simplistic animation of the process whereby telerobots could create landing pads on the moon, which would prevent sand blasting when landers land. As you can see, a lunar lander comes down and uh, the first one, you don't have to worry about uh, anything being sand blasted because nothing's around it. Uh, so John, the land we're, yeah. we're, we're not seeing the animation. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. No problem. Um, okay, well, anyway, um, so, so what's in the animation is, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a little cartoon showing a lander coming down and a telerobot comes out and lays down, uh, first of all, digs um, uh, a berm, uh, creates a berm and then a trench outside the berm. And that goes all the way around the lander to redirect the blast. Um, the telerobot then would put down a thin tarp um, in a circular fashion and, and they would, it would be tacked down initially. And then um, a, a more uh, robust blast resistant tarp would be laid down underneath the lander um, and tacked through the thinner tarp. And then um, the telerobots would then be, you know, moved out and go into the trench on the other side of the berm and then when the, um, the lander takes off, um, th there's, there's no um, dust whatsoever. Um, and the um, gases and plume from the lander would be redirected um, without disturbing any dust. So um, if you wanna see that video, I encourage you to go to the um, um, Space Development Network site, and uh, I will provide a link to that at the end of the presentation as well. Longer term, um, you know, we can use telerobots and automated equipment to use um, microwave generators to center the regolith um, into a landing pad. And then um, there's a lot of studies being done with 3D printing of, of bricks out of lunar uh, soil. So those can be configured into a landing pad as well. Now, um, this is a really cool one. I'm sure many of you have seen this and it was mentioned in um, Sean Mahoney's uh, keynote yesterday. So instant landing pad. So Mastin uh, has a um, NIAC phase one grant on studying this where um, uh, alumina spray would come be injected into the um, exhaust as the lander comes down, creating a landing pad. And then, uh, you know, you've got this uh, landing pad that's, that can be ablated when, uh, when uh, the lander comes down. So this is a really innovative um, solution that I really liked. So I wanted to include it and, and thank you Maston Systems for coming up with this. Um, this is kind of unrelated to landing pads, but it was mentioned earlier by um, um, Robert Zubrin. Um, you know, SpaceX is, is one of the three um, uh, companies um, looking at human landers. And uh, they're suggesting that, um, you know, RCS thrusters mounted way up on, on the, the, uh, the lander would uh, significantly reduce plumes. So that's great. And um, 
you know, we haven't seen a starship yet. So <laughs> obviously it's got to be validated, but this is, um, you know, they're thinking about it. So um, more to come on that. So we hope they're successful. Um, another way, solution two to minimize uh, equipment is uh, to uh, mitigate dust is to minimize the equipment wear. So um, we know that, uh, you know, dust when it's thrown up is falling in a parabolic arc in an air, airless environment. So if we design telerobots to move slowly, you know, the dust is not going to be kicked up very high. So things won't happen fast, but you can also, you know, um, tamp down on, on, on dust being thrown up high and, and distributed widely. Um, parts can be designed to keep, um, you know, the joints from the telerobot from um, uh, uh, getting contaminated if, if the joints are far uh, from the dust being kicked up. So put it up higher. Um, and then, you know, our mining industry has been designing equipment in abrasive environments for a long time. So we need to take advantage of that. And uh, with iterative engineering, we can optimize the designs. So um, that's that. Um, and then roads. So, um, you know, I think it was mentioned previously um, with the lunar rovers, we've seen this rooster tailing of dust as it as the, the, the rovers bounce around on the surface. This is because the surface isn't smooth. It's got, you know, uneven surfaces and, um, you know, potholes. <laughs> so the idea is um, to uh, create a road where you can, you can um, get a telerobot to smooth out the surface. So you want to um, compact the dirt and, and smooth it out and, you know, they could actually use a vibrating steamroller type mechanism is one solution. Um, and, and this would prevent, you know, bouncing and kicking up of dirt or at least mitigate it. So, so these roads, uh, I think, are a good idea to, you know, create a network on, on the moon. Um, you want to do it so that uh, you create access to valuable resources um, and any area where there's going to be popular exploration or tourism sites. Um, and then starting at the poles, you can extend down into the equatorial regions. And this can, can all be done ahead of time by telerobots um, prior to the arrival of large numbers of settlers. Um, and vehicles should stay on these roads and, and, and preserve the the landscape for future generations. So um, here's an example of you know a hypothetical network at the uh, South Lunar Pole. Um, you know you've got network network of networks of roads around you know the peaks of eternal light, various landing sites um, and and places of interest, and then you know eventually we'll be putting these roads all the way, you know, down to the equator and around the moon to uh, interesting sites. Another solution is just don't go outside. Um, much work can be do, done indoors um, and without a spacesuit. So um, that would eliminate that problem. Um, you can do scientific ex exploration with rovers without putting humans at risk. So a lot of the work doesn't need to be done by humans. A lot of it can be, be done by teleoperation from Earth. Um, there is a three second latency, and I think it was mentioned yesterday in the, in the presentation, this may be a problem, but it's uh, not that bad. So um, uh, we need to consider it. And then um, uh, eventually we'll have pressurized rovers. And so, you know, we're going to have clear bubbles in, in, in the front where we can look out and see what we're doing and manipulate um, samples um, with uh, uh, mechanical um, grippers or um, uh, other, other equipment. Um, NASA and uh, the Japanese uh, Space Agency, in, in cooperation with Toyota, is already working on this. And uh, there was an article recently um, 
Are you guys seeing this when I switch screens? Uh, we're still seeing the, the screen with solution number four. Okay. Yeah, well, I, uh, th th there was an article in Ars Technica um, last July 15th, and uh, NASA's first lunar habitat may be an RV-like rover built by Toyota. So um, uh, we are looking at this, um, and uh, NASA's working on it. So, uh, number five, leave the suits outside. Um, this is a, a creative solution. I really like this um, to prevent, you know, the dust from getting inside. Rear entry to the suits have been proposed by NASA. So suits are attached on the outside and crew enters and exits through the back of the suits, leaving dust outside. Um, you know, and, and as said previously, if we've, um, you know, surfaced these roads and compacted them, then um, really the only problem is dust getting on boots. So finally, you can um, wear uh, coveralls when you go outside to protect uh, the suits so that uh, you mitigate dust on, on the suits. And, and um, I think that's a creative solution as well. And then this is kind of in keeping with dust outside, um, but you know, if um, we're doing um, uh, growth of, of um, plants uh, to support life, um, do it hydroponically. You don't need to um, you know, bring soil from earth. Um, you can, um, or you know, from outside, you can um, use hydroponics with uh, nutrient solutions instead of soil. There are some plants that require soil, like fruit and nut trees. And a creative solution to this, without having to bring soil from earth, is to take some of the indigenous rocks um, that are on the moon, wash off the dust, and crush it into dirt, and then tumble the rough edges off, and, and you've got soil. And then, of course, you need fertilizer and everything. But that's a creative solution for um, uh, not not getting dust on your plants or in your habitat. <laughs> so in conclusion, um, you know, we, we know that dust poses a significant health problem um, for humans and equipment. We, we can design our operations and infrastructure and equipment to mitigate these risks. And this stuff is technically feasible. Um, we should take advantage of you know, our, our mining industry and their knowledge on this. En engineering solutions, um, it should be a high priority for this because we're not going to be able to, um, uh, you know, have this, this hazard uh, in, in habitats on the moon. So um, it's on the critical path in my mind. And um, I invite you folks to um, visit this link. Um, uh, I'm not going to click on it because it doesn't seem to be working. Um, but uh, most of the, the material for this presentation came from, from that, um, that link. So um, with that, um, that's the end of the presentation. And uh, all right. See if, see if there's any questions. Yeah. Thanks, John. Yep. That's a great presentation. It's definitely a problem that needs to be addressed. So, anybody out there have some questions or comments? And come on, it's it's regolith dust. Big problem. I'm sure there's plenty of ideas. Okay. Uh, this is Dave Chevron. Can you hear me? All right. Sure can. Okay. On the. Uh, on the suit court, I want to make sure everybody's aware of an issue that NASA really um, hasn't been talking about on that. I was, uh, I, I retired from NASA about seven years ago or so. I was, uh, I was on the suit court project from a maintainability, safety, and reliability perspective on that. The problem with that suit that everybody needs to be aware of is that if you do that configuration, you cannot get to the suit to maintain it. And uh, so if there's a problem with the suit, 
you've got to figure out how you're going to fix it. So uh, that means either got to have another way to get out and get the suit and get it off the port and get it back in to repair it or to replace it. Uh, that's a significant problem. Now, some things that could be done with that would be to have an outer airlock area, a temporarily pressurizable area that doesn't have to be pressurized all the time, but it could be closed. And then you could go in a suit like a, um, a protective gear and go out into this dirty environment that's going to be outside the suit port and take the suit off and bring it into an area where you can work on it or you can change it out for another one. So yep. that's one of the big problems. The other big problem is that if you've got any large number of people and you have any large number of suits that you need to have people go out in, and that's, that's an architectural decision whether you want to have people go in to have their own suits and go out or not, but you need to have one exit for every person. Okay. Noted. What do you, what do you think about that, John? No, no, all, all good points. Um, uh, what do you think about the coverall solution? In other words, I think, yeah, yeah. I mean, the coverall, I think, is a good solution. Uh, I think, you know, kind of having an area where you can come in and shower off after you take a suit off for a coverall off is, is a good solution. Uh, staying out as much as you possibly can is a good solution. Yep. All it's, right. We've got, um, uh, and I think it's, and I think it's going to be a combination of many different things that have to be done in, in parallel. Yep. All right. Thanks, David. Uh, we have a request, John, could you put your uh, final screen back up with uh, the link again? Is that working? Uh, is that working? Uh, I, hold on. We've just got a blank screen at the moment because it's at the end of your slideshow. Can you reverse it one? <laughs> there we go. Perfect. Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, we got a question from uh, Manny Pimenta. Has it been confirmed that lunar dust levitates electrostatically up to a couple of meters above the surface? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, so uh, maybe someone else on the call. Uh, I know it uh, can become very electrostatically charged. So it's, it's a problem for sticking to everything. Yeah, I, I've read articles where they say that a cloud of dust follows the Terminator as it moves across the, the surface because it electrostatically charges the ground and it just raises the dust up. So that could be an issue. And Chris Wolf says, yes, levitation can occur due to plasma interaction. So, yeah, it's a problem. Do we have any other questions or things you want to ask, John? We got a little bit of time. We can riff on, you know, lunar regolith and dust. If anybody's got a comment, uh, let's see. Tom Jemison says, has anyone tried microwaves on the regolith? So um, I, I haven't personally, <laughs> 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 but um, you know, I know that there are papers out there um, and, and people are considering it. Um, so right. I, it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't take much to, to get a magnetron and, and, and just try it out on a simulant. So um, that's a good question for the um, the woman that was on earlier. The centering that would be Kyla, I think. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, there's, yeah, there's, I, there's 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 been work done on uh, microwave centering of regolith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because it it actually activates the uh, the iron in the regolith, and the whole thing kind of melts together a lot better than you would think. Yeah. So um, that's that's what I've check read with check. Yeah, check with Rob Kelso at uh, Kennedy Space Center at the Swamp Works Lab on that. Yep, and uh, Rodrigo says that they've done uh, some centering tests over at Pisces too. Yeah, it's, it's controlling the amount of heat that you get from that and getting an even melt of the, uh, of the regolith seems to be the, the big challenge with the microwave. Yeah, 
Yeah, Joseph Cunningham says, does the regolith sintering process differ at all from terrestrial processes? I haven't looked at it from a terrestrial one. I mean, imagine it would if you're dealing with vacuum and all the other environmental conditions, it would be yeah, if you're doing and, it on and, the surface. Yeah, and 1.6G is Yeah, different. exactly. There's a, there's a whole lot of things that'll probably be different and challenging. Yeah, yeah. And we just melt it, you're right. <laughs> Some of the work that we've done using microwaves and, and uh, basalt has been both for uh, sintering applications as well as volatile extraction. Mm -hmm. um, for sintering applications, we found that uh, a susceptor works better uh, to, to provide the, the heat reflection you need for the, for the regolith. But yeah, definitely microwave centering is, is one very viable option for applications on lunar surfaces. Yeah, at least knock that dust down a little bit. Also, I have a question, John. Have you, have you looked at any of the work that, the, that uh, Carlos Calle at Candy Swamp Works have done with electrostatic dispersion of uh, lunar dust? I have not. You may want to look into that because they, they've been designing some panels that would allow the, the dispersion of, of accumulated dust over surfaces like solar panels or, or visors uh, by electrostatic charges. That's an innovative solution. Um, yeah, I could add that to the list. That's, that's a good recommendation. Thank you. Yeah, and I just read something <laughs> recently. They're working on materials that the material itself repels the the dust. Yeah. Well, well, somebody I was uh, working with it mentioned that they thought that the Apollo suits was were like probably the worst possible design for for dust. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. Don't necessarily take you know what happened on Apollo. This this is the way it's got to be. So I'm sure much better materials and the the way it was. Uh, I think one view of it at least is that. The, the dust has sort of jagged fish hook like edges and it wants to hook into the textile materials. Right. All right. So textiles may not be the best way to go for that particular mm -hmm. activity. I've seen I've seen some indications that using stainless steel and having vertical surfaces is uh, particularly a, a good configuration. Interesting. All right, well, we're almost out of time. Are there any more questions or comments for John? Yeah, if just, not, then, oh, go, sorry, go on. I posted a link uh, to all the articles that talks about uh, Carlos Calle's uh, work on lunar dust control. If you just do a search for, for him in NASA, uh, you'll find a lot of his work that he's been doing uh, in that respect. Oh, great. Thanks, Rodrigo. Appreciate thank it. You, thank you so much. All right, well, thanks a lot, John. We appreciate it. Great topic. And thanks, everybody, and I'll see you around the conference. Okay, thank you.